Good morning and welcome to Orchard and Baptist Church this morning. I'm Ashley, one of the ministers in the church and whoever you are, we're so glad that you've joined us today. Whether you're here in the building, joining us online or watching us on Catch Up, we hope that you'll feel at home and find your time with us a blessing and encouragement to you and your faith. If you're joining us for the first time, we'd love to be in contact with you. Just send in an email to the church email address, which is info at altringhambaptist.org. And you can find out more about us by heading to our website, altringhambaptist.org, and click on New to ABC. There you'll get to know us a little better. Hi, I'm Andrew, also one of the ministers here at Altringham Baptist Church. We believe that prayer is important for all of us. It's the way that God has given for us to communicate directly with him, to share the concerns of our hearts and to ask for his guidance. If you're here this morning and would like someone to pray with you at the end of the service, please come to the front left-hand side of the church and someone will be there to pray with you. If you're watching online, you can email prayer at alteringandbaptist.org and we will ask the prayer team to pray for your need. And if you would like someone to get in touch with you, to pray with you over the phone or to meet with you in person, please let us know and provide your contact details. We'll be starting the service shortly, so grab a seat. We're really glad that you are here. Good morning, everybody. I mean, some people out there have done 26.2 miles, but you've done a greater thing, people in the building. <laughs> you just got here. So congratulations to that. I'm going to do a um, classic teacher trick here. I, I'm going to say, turn to the person next to you and say good morning, because the battery's just died in this, and if I haven't got that, it's going to go wrong. So as hopefully Tim saves the day, not for the first time this week, I might add, um, have a quick hello to the people next to you. It's okay to say, I've not seen you before. Who are you? <coughs> okay, good morning again. Uh, welcome to all those who are in the building. Welcome to all those who are online who didn't quite make it. We'll question your commitment, but that's okay. You could have walked. You could have stood up at six. Um, can I invite you all to stand? My name's Dan. I'm one of the worship leaders here. Um, if it is your first time here, double well done. Um, uh, but you're very, very welcome. We, uh, w as worship leaders, we're in the process of, of doing a new thing. You, if you were here last week, you will have recognized that Jenny uh, led us in worship and there was more sound than you could see in front of you. And that's because we're, we're doing gadgets. Tim's uh, been working very hard trying to uh, drag us all into the 21st century. So when it all goes really well, Please do and encourage, come and encourage us. If it all goes really badly, wait till next time <laughs> and then come and encourage us. Um, but fundamentally, you know, it's, it's a tool to worship God, and so hopefully um, it enables us to do that. Can you uh, give me a pad? Father, thank you that we can meet together in your name. Thank you that you um, have given us this tool of worship where we can pour out our hearts, where we can come in gratitude and thanks. And we know, Lord, that not only does it please your heart, Lord, but it does something to us and for us as well. We 
turn to you Hope is stirring Hearts are yearning for you We long for you Cause when we see you We have strength to face the day your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all. Is 
Thank you that we stand here as a set in a group of believers. We believe in what you did. We believe that history tells us that. And we believe in what it meant. And what the consequence was. And how that's rippled down through the ages. And Father, sometimes in our divisions, we, uh, we can get caught up in uh, what other people think. And we know that we're a generation of, uh, or we've, we're being forced to 
kind of polar apart, polar opinions, Lord. But we are united, and we're united in you. And we're going to sing together this, I believe, the creed. And the words of this song are about what we can agree.
God our Father, we believe in Christ the Son, we believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for we believe in the name of Jesus. Holy, holy, holy God. Yeah. He was and is and is to come. We believe in you. We believe you rose again. And we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. Sing it one more time. hold on to these truths. And we can hold on to these promises that you've given. And we thank you. Amen. Amen. Morning, everybody. My name's Sally, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, if you're joining us online because you're trapped in by the marathon route, you're very welcome. Um, just a heads up, we're gonna have communion later, so um, as is our usual style, we like to invite some people just to help out with that. Uh, if you're at home, you wanna get some things ready for communion, um, please do so. Um, we've got some stories that we just wanna share from the Easter period. So if Bethan and Rachel oh, would like to come forward and just... Uh, give us some news about what was happening in their neck of the woods. That would be great. And Peter. Excellent. <clears throat> Who's going to go first? Bethan? Come on, Bethan. <laughs> Is that on? You want to take that? Oh, okay. Hello. So this is Bethan. Uh, she's got some news about what's been happening over on the brow. Yes, so I'm here instead of Claire because she's doing a practice for the Yorkshire Three Peaks uh, in a few weeks' time. Um, yeah, we had a, a great Easter weekend, um, which started with us making a labyrinth um, in, in the local church ground, which we've done for the last three years. So we, we put a labyrinth there and um, invite ND locally to walk it. So um, we did that and we found that... Um, there's a local young man we found later who had walked it several times, um, having come to faith fairly recently. Um, so that was very encouraging. Then um, Claire and I led a Monday, Thursday bring and share meal um, and did a communion with a reflective tenebrae type service following that, which was quite new for lots of people, but seemed to go down quite well with um, yeah, the locals and the group. Lots of people were involved in doing this in our local community, as you can imagine, there was lots of prep um, going on around that. Um, I think Easter Saturday we had a, um, a, a thing with the church and the brow and Easter and Easter fun day, um, which we borrowed a chalkboard that you used last year, I think, was it Ash here in, in and the prayer tree? So we had people building those, um, and we had those up, we had the labyrinth going, we had games going, um, and this was with Church in the Brown. Many of our folk were involved there, manning the, the chalkboard and having conversations with people, setting up, washing up anything that you name. I think we had um, 
uh, name a few people, Graham Potts, Dan, Rob, uh, Claire, myself, Jamie, uh, there's lots of people, lots of hands on deck. Um, so that was great and the, the end of that day we had a, um, a passion, a scratch passion play led by Mike and Becky Peacock who are also part of our community. So they got people to come on board and lots of people stayed for that because their kids were acting in that. So that was a real highlight to end Easter Saturday. Um, and then on Easter Sunday morning, something we've done on the brow for the last six years or so, I think, is um, we have a big cross that Jamie McKenzie made one year um, to bring down to some open ground in the middle of the brow. And it was so high the first year. Uh, over the years, it's kind of got smaller as the bottom has rotted away, I think, maybe. <laughs> But it's still a fairly hefty thing that we take down um, to the Crescent and it's just open a, a short reflective service again led by um, Jamie that uh, so we just gather around the cross at eight o'clock in the morning and um, yeah and we had a short service there um, and we started that I think many years ago when we had an Easter breakfast here and we wanted to do something on the brow before that so we started doing something um, that gave people time to then to go off to the other churches afterwards um, and then uh, culminated with a, a there was a local service in the church in the brown Sunday evening so it was um yeah it was a great Easter week really and it went on and I lovely to hear the kind of Easter here because I think we this, this is one of my things I think we rush through Holy Week too quickly hence the tenebrae and the reflective stuff and then we cut Easter short and you know we're Easter people and I think that it's great just to, to be here today which I'm not often I know um and just to continue to celebrate Easter that's great thanks Stephen. thank you thank you thanks very much Rachel, Peter. Hi, I'm Rachel and I coordinate the Community Hub. I'm Peter and I'm the Cap Debt Centre Manager. And Peter just said to me, we're both up because one of us is good looking and the other one has the brains. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk to you about the Easter hampers. So um, it was in the bulletin, we asked for help with volunteers and I don't know whether we put in the bulletin how many hampers we were hoping to put together. Um, we actually um, gave out 81 and those, out of those 81, 33 were for CAP clients. So CAP clients in Altrincham and Partington. Um, my wonderful volunteers, Catherine and Kim, phoned around to get some feedback from people. And actually, that 81 doesn't reflect the amount of people that benefited. So the um, estimated number who benefited was, I can't read it, with them, was 278. And 108 of those were CAP clients. It's a massive undertaking. Um, it was funded... Uh, grant funded um, with the cost of living grant um, which was fantastic that we were able to get that money we haven't got any for Christmas this year so just keep that in mind not wanting to rush through Easter but uh, <laughs> anyway um, and uh, we had a fantastic team of volunteers that came and helped on both days so over to you, Peter, not that you know that you're going to do this bit about the volunteers. So the volunteers, uh, in fairness, Rachel did ask me who they were, and um, I'm not the best with names, so you've written them down for uh, me. Yeah. So, um, but we, we had, I, I, I named a random lady that just happened to walk in and ask about volunteering that day, and bless her, we gave her a bag, and three hours later, she was still packing for us. So, uh, <laughs> and she wants to come back, which is fantastic. So I want to say is it thank you to, to Stephen, Jill, Sue, who's that? Dennis. Dennis. Anna. Anna. <laughs> I can't read the writing here. Alan. Brains and good looks. Yeah. <laughs> I know Alan, Pete and Joe, Ian, Leslie, Bob. Who's that? Mary. Mary. They're from St. Peter's. Okay. Uh, Jackie. Okay. Janice. Janice and Catherine. So thank you so much. Without you, we couldn't have done it. Um, Peter's fantastic and got all the flyers sorted out that went out in the hampers. So people um, are wanting to get involved with the hub uh, because we put the watts on and um, they knew about the uh, Easter services. 
Um, Sue made some fantastic Easter cards that went out. Um, Ashley put a message together. Ashley blessed the food, the prayer, the longest blessing ever in the history of blessings. And this woman that came early, she uh, came and prayed with us. I don't know what she thought about that, but anyway. Um, and some of the um, comments that we got. Uh, oh, mangoes. Mangoes appeared to be a thing. So um, Peter ordered mangoes and people had never, they, it was a luxury. So it was mentioned by two people that they would never have bought a mango, um, which is funny but absolutely wonderful as well. Um, comments like, quite overwhelming as kind and generous gift to receive so much and could pass on some of the veg. Good to try some things that she wouldn't normally buy and couldn't afford to buy, the mango. An inclusive experience, I presume she means for people, not just mangoes. Um, another person, she saved some money which she used for her daughter's new shoes. Made her feel rich due to good quality, full stomach, big help. Wonderful food, meat tremendous. You know, we're both vegetarian and every time we look at the screen of all this meat that we're ordering, we daren't tell the person that drops it off that we're actually vegetarian. Anyway, meat tremendous, huge difference to her Easter, felt like she, should go out, she could go out again. Happier time than expected. Never buy mangoes normally and so much cheese, no waste. Um, one of the really, two really important things that come out of giving out the hampers is people are able to be hospitable. Um, and we shouldn't underestimate that. We can often do that um, without thinking about it, but a lot of people have to think about it. And also, um, they get a lot with the hamper. They get a meat box and they get an Ikea bag full of fruit and veg and cheese. And some people say, well, why do you give them that much? You know, surely you could actually give out, you know, split it up and give out more to more people um, or give it, you know, distribute it better. But actually there's something about the abundance of it that is overwhelming. It reflects God's abundance. And when your life is measured all the time, when you are on a budget, to not, have, to not just get enough and to get more than enough is a tremendous blessing. So I just wanted to feed that back and say thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Thanks for those stories. Let's just pray. That's really good. God, thank you for the amazing things that you do through us. Thank you for all the wonderful activities on the brow of Easter and, and here as well. And thank you that people um, have heard about you and heard of your message through those activities that may not have heard otherwise. And thank you, Lord, that we have ways in which we can share your generosity with others. Thank you for grant funding that's available to us to use to bless other people. And thank you for those people who've received those gifts this Easter. We just pray, Lord, that they would know that that came from a place of love and a place that they, um, that they are welcome to come to any time. We pray that you would bless them. And thank you for all of those that helped in that time as well, Lord. Thank you that we have people who are willing to help and volunteer their time. Lord, we just pray for our children as they go out next. Lord, just pray for your blessing on them. I pray, Lord, that you would um, speak to them, speak to their little hearts and their young minds, and they would know who Jesus is and know the amazing thing he has done for their lives. And bless their leaders too, Lord, and just help them to be in tune with you today. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Rachel. If there's any young children uh, want to follow Rachel downstairs... Can the stewards wait on us for the collection now as well, please? Thank you. There's a little blue bucket going to do the room. If you are a visitor, please feel free to pass that on. Uh, if you like to give in other ways, um, there are 
means you can do that on our website or on the little code on the back of the chair, but thank you for that. Just a couple of other notices. Um, members will know that we're in the process of electing new elders. Um, there's uh, a revision went out on Friday to the process because uh, I myself need to um, come to the end or have come to the end of my term uh, as three years as a church secretary. So have to kind of step out of the process and offer myself a re-election. Um, and that includes Ness and Claire. Um, so the forms are around, I think there's some paper forms at the back, thanks Sheila. Um, if you wanna do a paper form or you can email them in to either Ian, can you wave Ian? Is Halwyn here as well? And Halwyn, so if you wanna hand your forms in to Ian or Halwyn, thank you, because I can't accept them because I'm involved as a, as a potential nominee. So thanks for that. Um, We've got our first elders meeting back after Easter uh, tomorrow. Um, we've got a bit of catching up to do. Um, we'll also be updating on um, the NHS lease that we've, uh, we've agreed on, we've agreed to proceed with at our last church meeting. Um, and yeah, I've got a few other bits and bobs on the agenda. I can't remember off the top of my head, apologies. But if anyone's interested, just, just drop me a line and I can share that with you. Um, Let's just pray quickly for, for the offering and then we'll just carry on with some notices. Father, thank you for your abundance. Thank you for your abundance that you bless us with and, uh, and that we can then share that and give that back to the work of your kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to use this properly and effectively to advance the work of your kingdom, Lord. And thank you. Amen. <clears throat> Um, because we've got elders elections, I thought it would be helpful to invite a couple of elders uh, up to the stage just to talk about their experience. So if Katie and Helen are around, please, thank you. Give them a round of applause. Thank you. My husband was got one of those waggy things. Thank you. Yay. I was waiting for that. <laughs> so uh, Helen's um, in her first year as an elder. Katie's in year two. Is that right? Good. Um, what do you think? I just want you to share some impressions with the church. What do you think is important and why is it important that we have an eldership team in ABC? There you go. Well... <clears throat> uh, I mean, for me, um, becoming an elder has really opened my mind as to the extent of stuff that needs to be done in order for a church to function. Um, so, so there's the church, there's also the fact we've got a charitable status and therefore you've got all that side of things, the trustee side. So um, obviously we come on a Sunday and we're involved in lots of activities, but there's lots of the stuff outside of that that just has to get done. And I don't think Ash and Andrew would be able to do that all, at all, you know what I mean? So I think it's great that as a body, because we're all called to be together, that there's more than just Ash and Andrew, and it's a sort of a, a wider representation, maybe bringing different perspectives as well, helping to support. Alongside the idea of it's, it's, it's a big old thing, we've got a community centre, we've got a community hub, we've got... ABC and all the different things we do. Um, the Baptist flavour of it is quite interesting. In well, quite interesting. It's quite essential. Sorry, everyone. Um, <laughs> spot the not brought up in the Baptist tradition. Um, so we we make all of our decisions. If you are, give us a wave if you're a member. Brilliant. Have a look round if you're not a member. Keep your hands up just for one second. There is method in the madness, I promise. Now, no, have a look round if you're not a member because those are the people who are making all of the decisions. Does that make sense? So it's not the elders that make the decisions, it's the people who are away, well, it is as well as members. So um, that eldership bit is an interesting um, idea because if we went to, I don't know, the Anglicans, it's the PCC that make the decisions, isn't it? So there's a small group that does it. So when we have elders here, our job is to act as facilitators is my, my view of it. So. If we brought everything all the time, we'd all, church meetings would be 
dire, wouldn't they? So you, you get your elders to find out what is the most important stuff from you and then f you know, facilitate it into bite-sized chunks so that you can make decisions. And right now, we've got this eldership process going through. What a great time to be an elder, because we're in the middle, slap bang in the middle of a visioning exercise to say, we're not what we were and we're not what we're gonna be, but it's really clear that God is doing a new thing. So if you're at all it, feeling like this is your home and you're gonna wanna be part of that conversation. And if you really are interested in how we tackle that, you're gonna wanna be an elder. Awesome. Keep that. Awesome. Um, Katie, in your time as an elder, what have you seen God do? Or where's he been at work? So, in the fir my first year was very much the inclusion conversation. So, you know, like Alan was saying, it was sort of getting our heads around that, but then also doing that as part of the church and bringing everybody together in that conversation. And that was the time I felt of, it was a, it was a big question, wasn't it? And it's, it's quite um, emotive as well, but it was seeing how everybody did listen to each other. We learned from each other and it was a real openness. And I think that since then, for me, you know, looking around the church, I think our church is a, lot of, is a much wider place now. It's, it's, a, it's a broader place. And I also feel that there's been, um, listening to God, we've, I think we've bec we're becoming more dependent on listening to God. I think we're always dependent on God. But in those kind of instances where we maybe have to learn to disagree or whatever, plus looking at things like the, the budget, the issues we have, we've, you know, we've had with the budget, all of those issues are things that I think we're learning to be more, de more much more dependent on God, listening to God, and openness, um, yeah. That idea that we weren't what we were, it, we're becoming a new thing, that's, that's where I see God moving amongst us. It's not 100% clear yet, is it? But when you get Rachel and Peter standing up here and Beth standing up here and telling us the things they're seeing God doing, there's no doubt about it. This sacrificial way of working that we've had for the last 10 years? How long have we had the hub for? Even more. 15 years? That is, we're seeing God using our, our sacrifice of time and commitment and passion. Right now, for me, I think it's relationships. So if I, if I take the worship leaders, I'm staring at Jenny. If I take the worship, where's Dan gone? You're over there. Um, we as a worship team have been meeting out of necessity. We worked out that none of us were in house groups and we were feeling that lack of that deep God relationship walk with others. And I'm seeing that echoed. There's a kind of yearning for relationship, I think, with God, with each other. And I think he's working through that. And that's one of the new things that he's doing. It's not a new, new thing, is it? But it's one of the things he's doing. Great. Thank you. Thanks, both. Um, I've asked you both to pray as well, please. Um, I think, Katie, if you could pray for the election process. And Helen, if you could pray, pray for existing eldership team. That'd be great. Thank you. Father God, I thank you that you're a God that speaks to each one of us, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that um, each person, each member of the church, Lord, would be able to spend that time with you, listening, listening to your voice as to who you feel uh, should be an elder at this time. Uh, and Lord, I pray too that uh, as the elders gather once nominations have, have come in, Lord, that again, you would give us uh, your mind, your heart, your ears, Lord, just to hear what it is that you want to do. Um, just pray that your Holy Spirit would just be over that whole discernment process. Amen. And Father, for the eldership team, Lord, I pray uh, your grace. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen our relationship with you, that you would uh, help us have ears to hear what it is that you're doing amongst us, Lord, and you'd give us the faithfulness to serve with true hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you both. And
And just uh, lastly, uh, we've got a baptism coming up in a couple of weeks, 28th of April. We've got three people um, who are going to be baptized. We've got Aslan, Sonia, and Jolly. And if there's anybody else, uh, please come and speak to Ash, if that's been on your heart, if you're not already baptized. Um, we believe in adult baptism, uh, consensual baptism, when, when you're ready and when you feel that's right. It's an important part of your beginning of your journey with God. So please come and speak to Ash if that's something you're interested in. Let's just spend some time in prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, you are the creator of all things, the beginning and the end. You are our father, our shepherd, you're our servant, friend, and brother. You are our priest and our king. You created all life and you sustain every life. Your glory and your majesty are beyond our understanding and your power is too awesome for us to fathom. Father, in your majesty and mercy, bend down from heaven and hear our prayers. Draw us close as we pour out our hearts to you. Our hearts are filled with love for you, but also our hearts yearn for more of you. We yearn for strength to resist temptation, and we yearn to please you in everything we do. We pray for healing by your miraculous power for ourselves or for those we know who are unwell, who are suffering or grieving. And we ask, Lord, that because you care, that you would intervene in situations that are difficult for us, intervene in areas that we need a breakthrough or a solution or a way forward. Generous God, thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for all that you've blessed us with. And for the things that we desperately need, please provide us with faith to trust you and your provision. Father, for us and the world that we live in, breathe love into the lives that are ruled by fear. Soften the hearts that are hardened by pride and whisper gently to those that are hurting. Sow peace where conflict divides families and countries. And we particularly pray for the escalation of events in the Middle East overnight, that you would bring peace, Lord. You are the God who formed us, the God who knows us, the God who loves us, the God who leads us, the God who feeds us, and you are the God who blesses us. You are the beginning and end of all we are, and all that we hope to be. You are worthy of our praise. May our praise glorify you. Father, we just pray for the message that Ash is going to bring. Pray that you would open our hearts to hear that message and bless him for his preparation and delivery of that message. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Uh, my name's Ashley. If you don't know, uh, I'm one of the ministers here. And um, uh, we're going to carry on week two of a th short kind of three-week series on how to disagree, which may sound like a strange thing to do in church on a Sunday, but the reason for this, well, there's many reasons why we're going to look at this subject. Um, we think that there is good disagreeing and there is bad disagreeing. Um, there's the kind of quarrelling, argumentative type, and there's the helpful, productive, light-shedding kind of type. Also, we know that in the Bible, there's quite a lot about disagreeing. Um, and last week, just as a bit of a recap, we looked at some of the things about what the Bible says about disagreeing. Um, we found out that there is something kind of instinctively human in our nature about having different opinions, that we live in a culture where perhaps increasingly we are disagreeing over things these days. We looked at the information overload that we almost have now. We can't process everything that we can uh, access 
and we are trying to play catch up to understand and process this and therefore we end up with people taking sides classically seen in social media posts etc etc and we need a template I call it a legend like you have on a map a key to set against all this stuff to understand it all and we ended up last week landing on the idea that it wasn't tolerance that we needed which is kind of putting up and shutting up it was more a case of bearing with one another which in biblical terms means let's have a conversation let's tease this all out and let's find a way to a better sense of working it out together um, and as i said bible is full of stories where there is disagreement in some form we know that jesus kind of disagreed a lot with the pharisees the religious leaders of the day and we looked last week at matthew's gospel and and i this week went through matthew's gospel and checked that there are 28 references to the pharisees in matthew's gospel and 17 of those 28 are about an argument so it wasn't like everything that jesus did with the pharisees but an awful lot of it was like contention the disciples argued amongst themselves more than once uh, in luke chapter 22 we looked at that last week they were arguing about who was the greatest and in fact that was a repeat of the argument that exactly the same argument in luke chapter 9 they'd already been there hadn't resolved it came back to it for a second time in acts 10 Peter has a disagreement with the church in Jerusalem about who can you baptise? Have a theological discussion and disagreement about that. In Acts 15, Paul and Barnabas disagree over this person called John Mark. Paul says, I want John Mark to do this. And uh, Barnabas says, no, I want John Mark to do that. And they kind of never quite resolve that disagreement. And this week, we're going to look at one of Paul's letters uh, the first letter to the church in Corinth and here he addresses a particular argument so what I'm going to do is going to read a bit from the Bible we're going to look at kind of some idea we're going to show you some slides of an idea about arguing and then we're going to look through this passage in the Bible and try and make some sense and see if it can help us practically with those issues of disagreement so our reading here 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and a bit of a head start to get what's going on the argument is that some people think well we belong to paul and another group are saying no no we belong to somebody else called apollos there's this disagreement so here we go and so brothers and sisters i could not speak to you as spiritual people but rather as people of the flesh as infants in christ I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. In other words, he's saying that they were kind of babies in the faith and couldn't quite take on the kind of more complicated stuff. Even now, you're still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, this is the argument, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? For when one says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned to each. I, in other words, Paul, planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labour of each. For we are God's servants, working together. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God giving to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it. 
For no one can lay a foundation other than the one who has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If you think that you are wise in this age, you should become fools so you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. Finally, so let no one boast about human leaders. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all belong to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to you. Now, I was going to I was going to draw a draw a a picture at this point, but I'm not going to draw the picture. I'm going to save my drawing skills for a minute or two. I'm going to show you a picture on the screen. And there I've got a a cross, and at the top I've got opposition, and at the bottom, cooperation. Now, I think we learned last week, actually, there were good things about disagreeing, because you kind of work things through and have it out and get to a better place. But there are two ways you can do that. The opposition way is the wrong way. The cooperation way is the right way. Okay, so two ways to argue. Opposition, cooperation. And also on either side, I've given you two options about how you might do that. You could do it directly, direct opposition, or you could do indirect opposition. And again, direct cooperation and indirect cooperation. Now I've completely bamboozled you at this point. So let me kind of pan it out a little bit more easily. Top left. If you directly oppose somebody in an argument, you are likely to come across and criticise, blame, get angry, get demanding, get dominating. Perhaps there's a power play at work. That's the way, and you think you understand what I'm saying in that respect. You've all either done that or be on the receiving end of that. That's the kind of direct opposition, wrong way to do it. There is, of course, the more subtle kind of uh, passive aggressive, uh, indirect opposition way of challenging person. And that is, oh, I've put two up there anyway. Uh, That is when you induce guilt in the other person, where you express hurt, sadness, that you're the victim. You remind them that they're supposed to be kind to you because you're in a relationship with you. So it's a kind of way of opposing the other person, but doing it in a somewhat underhanded, indirect way. But being more constructive, because this week's all about being more constructive, there is an indirect, cooperative way of having a disagreement where you use reason, negotiation, You explore solutions and alternatives. You weigh up pros and cons, and you are focused. Oh, which should have been, I think I've got them the wrong way round. I have. (laughs) Sorry about that. So the bottom right should be at the bottom left, and the bottom left should be on the bottom right. But then you're already there again. So uh, the reasoning, the negotiation, the exploring solutions should be the direct way. I apologise. The blue should have been on the other side. And the indirect way is, you're not actually talking directly about the issue, 
but you're expressing affection to the person. You're using humour. You're trying to minimise the problem. You're trying to express positive aspects of the relationship. Convey optimism, restraining your negative reactions and emotions. So that was a little graph they came up against, which I thought might be helpful in trying to show how there can be wrong ways of disagreeing, the confrontational, oppositional way, or there can be helpful ways to disagree with somebody where you cooperate and you express the things at the bottom of the graph if I'd got them on the right sides. Why disagreement can be good then? Why it can be good? You may know the 18th century writer, poet, artist, William Blake. Is that a name that you are familiar with? He once wrote this about disagreement. Without contraries is no progression. In other words, I think he's trying to say, without a little bit of argy-bargy and some pushback and something, you're not actually going to get somewhere, which is an interesting idea. That's kind of reiterated in a modern-day business guru, guru a, a Roman Catholic guy from America called Patrick Lencioni, who said something similar. He wrote this, Great teams do not hold back with one another. They are unafraid to air their dirty laundry. They admit their mistakes, their weaknesses and their concerns without fear of reprisal. If we don't trust one another, then we aren't going to engage in open, constructive, ideological conflict. I think he's arguing for the bottom left-hand corner, direct cooperation. Let's talk about it and move it on. In fact, some of you know that this guy, Lencioni, wrote this famous kind of business book called Five Dysfunctions of a Team that I read many years ago. The dysfunctions being this. These are the things that are wrong in teams. An absence of trust, a lack of commitment, an avoidance of accountability, inattention to the goal, the results, and finally, interestingly, a fear of conflict. In other words... Everybody keeps mum, no one says anything, but no one actually expresses what they think and how they feel about the situation. We've already referred to perhaps this morning to different analogies for the church. The church is a body, the church is a family, the church is a community. Also, I think the sense that church is a team. So in some ways, I think these words do resonate with us. But how do we as a church disagree? Do we do it in the oppositional way or do we do it in the cooperating way? I read this week about a guy called Gary, Gary Tan. And Gary Tan came up with this idea. I guess it repeats some of the things that we've already said. But he's got success on this side and conflict on this side and um, if I put obviously this is low conflict here and this is high conflict here and this is what he proposes if you can all see because some of you are around the other side he proposes that actually, if there is low conflict, then you're not going to be much very successful. And if you've got high conflict, you're not going to be very successful. What you need... Well, the curve, he says, goes something like that. If you have a degree of conflict, those conversations, you're having out, you're talking together, if you're able to do that in a good way, with kind of, you are doing it, then you're going to be successful. If you do it too much, it ain't going to work. If you do it too little, it ain't going to work. It's the vote for the idea that we can disagree and actually something useful might come out of it. And this is not just a secular, businessy idea. Here's a guy you probably may well have heard of, a guy called Tim Keller, famous preacher and book writer in America, Christian guy, and Tim Keller said this, 
Friends become wiser together through a healthy clash of viewpoints. Perhaps you're bringing to mind those verses from Proverbs 27. As iron sharpens iron, when there's that clash, actually something good can come out of it. Anyway, we read 1 Corinthians 3, didn't we? Let's get back to that passage and see what Paul can say to help us on this issue. Paul was addressing this disagreement in the church in Corinth where there seems to be these two factions. One group support him, Paul. The other group supports another person called Apollos. And so there's this disagreement on. And Paul rightly condemns at the very first point the idea of absolute high conflict, which isn't going to help. He says in verse 3, if you've got your Bibles there, for as long as there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, are you not of the flesh? So too much argy-bargy, too much conflict and quarrelling and jealousy, that isn't going to help you at all. But in addressing it, Paul is going to have to face up to an issue which is really important for their church life. In fact, it's a potentially a church life-threatening issue. If nothing's done about this issue, perhaps this church that was one will go off and become two separate churches. One called, I don't know, the Pauline Church of Corinth and one called the Apollosi Church of Corinth, whatever the other name might be. And he wants to not allow that to happen. But Paul's one of the named characters in there. There must be a huge temptation for Paul to just justify his position and say, you know, those ones who are the Paul supporters, well, of course they've got it right because of all these great reasons that you would have to be a follower of Paul. But no, he doesn't do that kind of crass thing either. Paul addresses the issue face on. It's not a case of staying quiet and letting the thing pass. Face on. Because he knows he's got to release all that pent up frustration that has brought the church or these factions to this point. A bit like that gas leak that perhaps a little bit of gas you can smell a bit when you got your camping stove out that's not a problem but if it builds up and builds up over a period of time then the impact can be quite devastating this is that gas explosion in the Wirral a few years ago that devastated that square in the town if the issue is not addressed that uncontrolled conflict can destroy a whole group we need some female wisdom, I think, on this issue. And I often turn to Brené Brown, the American uh, writer and speaker, who says this. People often silence themselves or agree to disagree. But without, fu well, without fully exploring the actual nature of the disagreement, for the sake of protecting a relationship and maintaining connection, but when we avoid certain conversations and never fully learn how the other person feels about all the issues, we sometimes end up making assumptions that not only perpetuate, but deepen misunderstandings and that can generate resentment. Without addressing this issue, the situation in Corinth will have festered and may have destroyed the church. So the two factions, I belong to Paul, I belong to Apollos. He doesn't make the judgment. He doesn't weigh up the two groups and say, you need to do this rather than that. Interestingly, he does something far more careful, far more thoughtful, something more true. We read in verse 5 this, he said, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. Steve, can I borrow you for a moment? 
Can you come and hop up here? <clears throat> I have my trusty beach ball illustration. So, you are looking at that beast ball. Can you describe it to us? It's round, it's colourful, it's got horses on, it's got rainbow colours. It's got unicorns on, I'll have you know. Unicorns. unicorns on. <laughs> okay, can you just tell how many panels of unicorns and how many polyp panels of rainbows? I can't see because I can't see the whole board. <laughs> You're ruining my illustration here. <laughs> How many panels of unicorns can you see? Two. Two. How many rainbows can you see? Well, rainbow colours, one. Okay. Because I would contend that there is one panel of unicorns and two colours of rainbow. Because, of course, on Steve's side, there were two, and on my side, there were one. Thank you, Steve. You can sit down. <laughs> My point was simply to illustrate the fact that it um, depends on where you're standing, you see the issue in different ways. From there, you can see that there are two panels of unicorns and one of a rainbow. But on my side, I was looking at one panel of unicorns and two colours of rainbows. Each had a different perspective on exactly the same thing. Which is quite challenging to think that the other person may be right as much as you think that you are right. And this is an important principle in what I think Paul is trying to say. You would have heard of the guy Wilbur Wright, one of the Wright brothers, one of the pioneers of aviation. Wilbur Wright once wrote to his friend and said this to him. He said, no truth is without some mixture of error and no error so false, but that it possesses some elements of truth. <clears throat> if a man is in too big a hurry to give up an error, he is liable to give up some truth with it. And in accepting the arguments of the other man, he is surely to get some error with it. Honest argument is merely a process of mutually picking the beams and moats out of each other's eyes so both can see clearly. Men become wise just as they become rich, more by what they save than by what they receive. After I get hold of a truth, I hate to lose it again, and I like to sift out all the truth before I give it up to an error. Paul didn't say the Pauline supporters are right and the Apollo supporters are wrong. He gave them a different perspective. The perspective was, as we read, that one may plant, one may water, but God gives the growth. He looked at the situation from a different perspective, rather than rubbing each other's noses in it. <clears throat> so who is the greater? Is it Paul or is it Apollos? The answer is, you're both wrong. Because the greater, more truthful, fuller, better answer came to bear. That it's God who is doing the work through both of them. My observation would be, though, that when we engage in these disagreements, it's not just our intellects that are at work, it's our hearts that are at work as well. Because there is a relationship involved in what we are doing. People feel or can feel especially insecure, uncertain about themselves when they engage in an argument or dif dis on a difficulty. And one of the first casualties of a disagreement can indeed be the relationship between two people or two groups. What we need to find is where is the trust? Where is the trust that enables the sense that the relationship will not be broken I will not be made a fool of. I will not be have to walk away even though I disagree and even though I may be found to be wrong. So when we're in a disagreement, the relational issues are, are, are just as important. 
Are the different groups, would you say of those people, they are known here? Are they valued here? Are they loved here? And of course, all those things can take time. It takes time to build up a reservoir, a history, a back catalogue of reasons why this is their home, this is where they're known, this is where they are loved. So that even if a person makes a mistake or gets the wrong end of the stick or a disagreement emerges, it's not going to be the end of the world because the person is loved and valued here. And Paul makes this interesting appeal to the valuing of each person in this disagreement. In verse 16, he said this, Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? You are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you. I think what Paul is trying to say is he's trying to big up both sides. He's trying to value and demonstrate the worth and the merit and the importance of each side being present here in this situation. Paul cites the truth about what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ, a place where the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in which grace he is diffusing this bigger tension that one is right, one is wrong. You know what? You're all valuable here. And Paul's level of relationship with the church there enables him to do it. When we have disagreements, that level of relationship that we have with the other person is really crucial It's really crucial to what we can say to the other person, how we can say it. So imagine you've just got to know somebody, you're in very little early stages of a relationship or a friendship, and a disagreement occurs or arises between you. Something happens that you wish it hadn't. You can imagine, therefore, that to try and negotiate that, it's actually quite difficult. You've got no backstory of relationship and history with this person and therefore you have to tread really carefully in what you say and particularly how you say it but take somebody else you've known for years somebody who's in company you are really at ease with you know them their families their backstory they know all those things about you as well you can sit down at the dinner table with them you can go around and borrow their hedge trimmer whatever it is having the conversation there in that situation can be in a sense so much easier you can perhaps push a bit further You can try a bit harder, not transgressing all those things of going to this place, but in that situation, you can say things you can't in that simple, young relationship. I read this, and I'll try this out on you. You might want to come back to me about this. But I read this week that one of the tests of a kind of a strong relationship is whether you can tease the other person. Can you tease them? Can you crack that joke at the right moment? Many years ago, I was invited to go to the headquarters of the West Yorkshire Police in Wakefield for a day. And the context was that I was invited to speak at a disciplinary hearing. Uh, A local uh, police officer on the estate where I worked, uh, who was Uh, a really great officer, really well loved, uh, really intelligent, I would say, in his policing, had also done something really, really stupid and was up on a disciplinary and potentially was about to lose his uh, job as a police officer. And at the disciplinary hearing, you could bring people to give kind of testimony reference about his work on the estate. So he invited me and one of the local councillors to come and do that. It was an incredibly tense day. Uh, I spent the, virtually the whole day sitting in the canteen of the West Yorkshire Police headquarters in uh, Wakefield. And eventually, towards the end of the afternoon, we received a message that, in fact, without our testimony, the panel had reached a decision. So it's kind of a wasted day for us, but hey-ho, I had a very good conversation with a local councillor. We were taken from the canteen towards the room where the officer and all the parties were just leaving. 
and heard the news that, in fact, he was going to keep his job. There was no whelping or cheering, just a huge sense of relief amongst him and his colleagues. And as we turned in silence, the group of six or seven of us started walking towards the door towards our cars. One of, and I'll never forget this, one of the police officers who was a colleague of the one who was up on the charge, he piped up and said, to be honest, I'm really disappointed with the outcome and the judgment they'd made. Somewhat shocked, we kind of turned and looked at him. And then he said, you see, I'd already put in a request to have his boots. <laughs> Teasing can go wrong without the relationship, without sensitivity or affection. In that context, it worked for all the reasons of what was going on. Teasing is, in a sense, a test of the robustness of your relationship with somebody. Can you get away with making that cheeky comment or observation, pulling their leg about that weird thing about them? And let's be honest, there are weird things about all of us. So disagreeing is actually a really useful, helpful, important part of life and church life. We can go about it helpful ways or destructive ways. Useful ways, diffusing ways, or unhelpful ways. What the world doesn't need is a church that agrees about everything. What the world really needs is churches that know how to disagree well and do it in relationship. Amen. Steve wants the beach ball. Um, right, could I um, invite six people, please, to come and just help with serve with communion? Anybody, uh, please feel free to come up. Um, while you're having a think and walking forward, I just thought it really good just to read a really amazing statement of faith from uh, the book of Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossians. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you, who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your sinful thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. So with that in mind, I'm going to jump to 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> and Paul writes and describes the communion that Jesus gave with his disciples. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. And a few verses later, Paul invites everyone to examine themselves before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. So take a moment now to think and bring before God any sin or thought or attitude that you need to confess to him before you come up to receive. but don't let that stop you from getting out of your seat to take communion. The passage I've just read from reminds us, you who were once far away from God, you were his enemies, separated from him by your sinful thoughts and actions, yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. <coughs> Can I have one more person just to help up? Thanks, you. <clears throat> so I invite you to take that active step to get up out of your seat and come forward Uh, or we'll have a station at the back to come forward and receive the bread and the wine. And just know that God has reconciled you to him through Jesus on the cross. Okay, thank you. (coughs) Do you you want to go there? Can you give it? What's your name? Kate. Do you want to come forward here? Thank you. sing our final song. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so Darkness 
God is running after you to bless you. God bless your conversations wherever they take place. May your words bring wisdom, compassion, comfort and peace, encouragement and change into someone's life this week. And in this blessing given to others, may your life be blessed also. Amen. Please join us for refreshments and uh, have a good week. Thank you.